And we need to educate those, those girls who have chosen a STEM field, we need to educate them on the importance of what they've done and also the importance of the role that they play in going back and talking to, to younger girls because who can connect better to you know, a 13-year-old girl than someone who's 18 or 19 or 20, right? They can connect better than any of us in here, right? They can relate. So to share with them what it's like to be studying this stuff. I mean, that, that's really, it's an important part of it. And then finally, and we probably don't have anybody here who's in, uh, from Department of Education or anything, yeah, so. <laughs> but we are all constituents. We are all constituents, right? So we can influence. And it's really important that you take the time to do that, right? Um, enforce application of Title IX. So I know we have the godmother of Title IX here, so I can't even, yeah. I can't even go uh, to that level. Uh, but supporting scholarships for young women to go into the field, as well as underrepresented groups, is critical. Um, and to support the programs that help retain them as they're going through the programs, both in undergraduate and graduate school. Women in engineering, minority in engineering programs are really critical, and I know played a key role in it for me in, in making it through those years. So that's my homework for everybody. Um, I want to end again, really stressing the importance of how it takes all of us to, to work together, because um, I really do think we can we can make a huge difference. And in particular, all of you, in particular, I want to thank the teachers because you do make a difference every day and. Think about that every day because you're touching so many girls out there. Um, and I, I want to thank you for that. So, outstanding job. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, I, I know anybody who has to run, please run. I will stay if anybody wants to ask questions or. Okay. So, I'm, I'm open. I'm just going to see if we have that microphone. Look like it, but if you have questions, just speak up. Uh, uh, we'll hear you. Yeah, I, have a, I, I was really struck by your story about how you took a test and you failed. This is the first time you failed the test, and your immediate assumption was, I'm not cut out for this. Absolutely. And you had someone there to say, No, this is the first time you've been challenged. It's such a big issue. I think that's a lot of what makes us self identify as good or bad at something that chases a lot of us uh, STEM fields. So maybe you can talk a little bit more about that. And, how we can get some of those attitudes towards failure to change. Well, you know, it, it is really important, and I, I still spend a lot of time in that, not just with students, but there's a lot of professional women who feel they're not deserving to be where they are. Um, you know, they feel like, oh, I, I don't deserve to be here. It's the same self-confidence issue of feeling, well, I didn't do well here, I must, I have to drop out, I, I'm a failure, right? It's, it, we have to encourage girls to focus on, right, they can, they, they can do it, self-confidence, and that, you know what, sometimes, and I had a boss that said to me th this exact phrase, it's okay to get a B. You know, it really is, and because the boys are fine getting a B, it's okay to get a B. We are thinking, no, if it's not an A, we're, we're, we're a failure, right? That's not the case, right? And it's, we just, it's, it's, I think it's just, again, instilling that confidence in them. And the, I think the great thing about girls' schools is that they can, you know, that they have that time where it's just girls that they can focus on excelling with just girls, right? They don't have that competition. A lot of them, when they get into college, then I think they'll be ready to have that, that competition. But that they don't, they don't feel, I'm a failure, I have to drop out, is critical. And it's that person that has to be there to catch it and say, no, you can keep going. You know, and again, it's that, it's that mentoring. Other questions? Or comments or thoughts? I have a question regarding retention. Uh, you talked about it at the end. Do you know any, any policies or procedures or techniques or best practices for retention? I mean, once we get girls in the pipeline interested in the STEM field, how do we make sure you know, that they can advocate for themselves? And how do you just keep them there? Yeah. Yeah. So retention, um, in particular, the area that I focused on is retention in uh, in higher ed. So in college, where because uh, once we get them in there, we work really hard to get them in there, and then the, the the dropout rate is actually quite high for both females and minorities. 
And, uh, and that's why I mentioned the program. So there's every, every uh, higher ed institution usually has a program that focuses on whether it's women in engineering or uh, women in the sciences or something. That, that those are really key to retention. And the problem is a lot of girls don't know they exist. So I try to get that message out there. Go find out what that program is. Go find out who the advisor is for that program and get involved. Because when, once you've engaged in something like that, an organization, all of a sudden you see all these other women that are in the same situation as you. If you're a freshman, all of a sudden you're talking to juniors and seniors who can relate. You, they can tell you, hey, I remember what that lab was like. Yeah, let me, let me tell, give you a couple hint or, uh, hints on how to get through that, a couple tips. And you start to have that network. And once you start to have that network, you feel connected. And your retention uh, likelihood goes way up. So finding those key programs and getting the message to the girls about those programs is really critical for retention. It's the same thing in industry, by the way. Connecting them with networks within, the in within industry is critical as well. What kind of skill sets um, are going to be successful for girls to go into engineering? I hear sometimes that girls have to be very strong in math and science, and other times they hear they don't have to be strong, particularly strong in math and science. And I'm wondering what kind of kids to really encourage to go into So engineering. what I always say is you don't have to love math, but you have to know how to use it. Math is a tool to solving problems, right? I mean, and those of you, no one's, I'm not trying to insult anybody who loves math, so more power to you. But uh, you have to know how to use math as a tool. That's how we solve problems, and that's, that's essential. So that part of it you have to have, but you don't have to love it, right? So they have to, they, and they have to have, more so than the math and the science, they have to have a desire to solve problems somehow solve problems. And that's what I would go after more than just focusing on the subject. Because as soon as you say math, they go somewhere mentally, yeah. Yeah. right? They're thinking of something. And if, but if you say, you know, do you like trying to figure out things? Or do you like trying to solve these little problems? And it doesn't mean, you know, that you sit home and do puzzles at home or anything like that. It just means, do you like thinking about how to do things? Those are the kids that I think have that propensity to, to succeed in engineering. And I definitely stay, stay away from saying, you have to love it. You have to love math. Um, and science, I think, is, tends to be a little bit easier. It has a little less of a stigma than the, than the hardcore math piece, because um, I think kids can relate to usually one type of science or another that they, that they enjoy. But once you get into engineering school, you have to have your core math and you have to have your core science. I mean, you have to take chemistry and physics just like everyone else. But once you get that, that and you really get into the engineering, it's all, it's all applied. It's just apply, it's applying it. So it's not just going through the, the math book. It's, it's the whole thing is just about how you're solving problems. So it's just, it's, it's that kind of that core. Did I answer your question? How flexible right now is um, the work schedule for women when <laughs> starting a family? That's one of the questions that girls look at. Yes, a that's a great question. So. I have been very fortunate. I work for a company that has allowed tremendous flexibility from, the, from day one. I have worked just about every type of schedule you can think of. I've worked, part, worked full-time. I've worked part-time. I've worked flex schedule, which means you cram your 40 hours but into some other form of a, than an 8 to 5 type of day. Um, I take extended, took extended leave when both of my daughters were born and came back and was able to hit the ground running. Um, so. It is very flexible. And the nice thing about engineering is there, it's kind of constantly there and there's constantly problems. So you come back and you, you just jump right back in again. Um, and, and frankly, I think that's where industry has gone because we have this crisis of not having enough STEM professionals. It, it's whether they wanted to or not, they have to have this flexibility because if you start losing young woman professionals because they went out to have a child and they don't feel that they can come back at 40 hours a week or come back after only six or eight weeks of leave, then they're not going to. If they have any option to not come back, then they won't. But if you give them the option of coming back, hey, do you want to come back three days a week? Do you want to work four hours a day for five days? Whatever you want, if you give them that option, they'll come back, right? Or take a year off and then come back, right? And that's how you retain that workforce. And you have to be like that because, you know, that's, that's where we are from an economic standpoint right now. So it's incredibly flexible. 
probably, in my opinion, one of the most flexible uh, of all the uh, careers right now in industry. Other questions? Was there some, one other one on the side over here? Well, actually, just to piggyback on that one, when you say it's the, one of the most flexible, do you think that's specific to Raytheon, or do you think actually as a career? I think it is as a career just because I know that I, I, I'm in, as a member of the Society of Women Engineers, I, I interact with women in other, um, at other companies who have had very similar situations, um, small and large companies. I, I think I'm, yeah, I think Raytheon has been a, a definitely a leader in the area, but there are other companies doing it as well. The other thing is, is the, um, you know, virtual office that we have today. And these kids are growing up with this, right? I mean, they, they can live online. So you don't have to sit in your office to be working, right? And so the fact that, you know, I can stay at home when my daughter's sick, and I'm still working, right? Um, you know, I help her when I need to, but I can also be in a conference call. I can also, we have, you know, same time and instant messaging, and right? So, well, I can participate in a lot of things at work, and no one and everybody else is all over the globe too, so it doesn't really matter that I'm not in an office in a building in Massachusetts because I'm talking to people in Huntsville, Alabama and out in California, and, you know, so it doesn't matter. And, and the kids should know that, right? Because that's what they're growing up with, right? They're interfacing online all the time. Other questions? Well, again, I thank you for your time. Thank you. thank you, Ellen. And I wanted to say a few other thanks before all of you uh, dash away. I want to thank, of course, uh, Dr. Ferraro for her inspiration and her enlightenment. And I think all of that's going to reverberate with many, many students in, in all of our schools and many classrooms across the country. Thank you all for being here. I want to thank Wellesley College for their hospitality, our sponsors, whom I hope you had a chance to uh, have some con conversation with, because without their support, we wouldn't have been able to uh, have done this so successfully. <coughs> And I want to particularly ask you all uh, to uh, recognize our program um, director at the National Coalition of Girls School, Leslie Coles, who put this all together. <laughs> take a bow. Take a bow. Take a bow. <laughs> and I hope you have found this uh, an enriching and enlightening and stimulating program that will not only enrich your lives, but also everything that goes on in your classrooms. And I want to ask you one more thing, and that is to put in your uh, calendar February the 10th to the 12th, 2012, because the National Coalition of Girls Schools, along with the Young Women's Leadership Network in New York, will be co-sponsoring uh, a groundbreaking, uh, bridging educational program on educating girls. It will be in Washington, D.C. It will be for public schools, for private schools, uh, for parochial schools, and bringing together different parts of the education world, which have not really worked together, much less uh, had a conference on educating girls. So I hope you will tuck that away, and uh, we'll let you know a little closer to the date, but just want to be sure that you, uh, you mark those dates in the meantime. So thank you all very much for being here, and safe travels. Thank you.